Dear brothers and sisters, as we sit here today in this Salatul Jum'ah, as every single lecture and every single Islamic gathering, it's always the case that you have a variety of people. All of us are sitting here together with the intention of fulfilling our obligation of Salatul Jum'ah. But at the same time, within this very room, if there is 300 or 400 or 500 people here, there is 800 or 1000 thoughts that are going through our heads. And each person has come here with a different mindset. Some of us are here and we're still thinking about our jobs, we're still thinking about that, that which we left behind and that which we will go to after Salat al-Jum'ah. Some of us are here looking for a wow effect. What's the Imam going to say this week? What's going to impress me this week? What's going to change my heart this week? Some of us are just here because we have to be here. Some of us put our dunya on the, sh on the shelf with our shoes. Some of us have come here and we are waiting for something to come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to completely change our hearts. And dear brothers and sisters, I want us to imagine the khutbah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for a moment. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would not stand on the minbar and wow the sahaba with some new fact that they've never heard. Bring some sort of you know, idea or some sort of concept that they've never heard of before. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did not come on the minbar and, come and, and say something new to the sahaba. In fact, the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his khutbahs were extremely precise. His khutbahs were short and as the ulama say, most of it was from Surah Al-Qaf. And it was as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala referred to it in the Qur'an, nothing but dhikr, a reminder. A reminder to the Sahaba and a reminder in its nature is not something that you've never heard before. It's something that reminds you of something that you've heard before and it brings out the best in you. The hearts were ready to receive it. That's why in the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, although his khutbahs were simple and to the point and they were reminders in their nature, as Al-Hasan radiallahu ta'ala anhu wa rahimahullah says, whenever the Sahaba would leave the masjid after Salat al-Jum'ah, they would leave behind puddles from their tears. Think about that for a moment. The same words that we started off our khutbah with today, more or less khutbah al-Hajah, were the same words that Tufayl ibn Amr al-Dawsi rahimahullah radiallahu ta'ala anhu when he came from ad dawsi the physician, so it's not because he was someone who was so simple-minded, he was intelligent, he was the doctor of his tribe. He was the one who Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu would accept Islam on his hand because he was from his tribe. He was someone who was at such a class, who belonged to such an intellectual group that the people from his tribe were afraid that whenever he went and he heard the words of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, something might happen to him. They knew how intelligent he was. But this man, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, who was advised to ignore Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to place cotton in his ears, to not listen to a word that he said, would accept Islam based on, inna alhamdulillah. The same words that we start off every single khutbah with, that everyone looks at the Imam blankly when he's saying them, like, okay, when's he gonna get to the real topic? It was the same words. And dear brothers and sisters, this is what I want to do today. I want all of us to think about this. Why is it that our hearts do not have the capacity that the hearts of the Sahaba had? Why is it that our hearts do not reflect upon the Qur'an the way that the Sahaba reflected on the Qur'an? What is it about the words that they were hearing that was different from the words that we're hearing? Except that it was from a different mouth and it was from the most honorable, honorable mouth of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But it was the same words that they would hear. Friday, every single Friday, it was the same Qur'an that we recite, the same Qur'an that we rush through, that our hearts do not become affected by at all. It's the same exact reminder. It was nothing but dhikr. And in order to truly illustrate this, dear brothers and sisters, we go to the life of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu. 
And I know everyone has heard the story of Umar bin al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And we all love Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And your masjid is named after Umar al-Farooq radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So I can't really tell you anything new. But the story of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu illustrates something magnificent. It illustrates how one man, if he does not want to be moved, can be as stubborn as can be. But once he allows himself to be moved, can be the most influential person in the world. And an unbelievable change can take place in him. The story of Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu's exposure to the Qur'an does not come from Surah Taha. The story of Umar's exposure to Qur'an comes way before that, the same words we recite. Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu was someone who was constantly drunk. We all know the story of, of him radiallahu anhu in his jahiliyyah. Someone who would bury his daughter alive. Imagine how harsh he had to be to do that. Someone who was so deep in his ignorance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that when he reflects on his story of worship before Allah azza wa jal, he talks about when he used to come to their version of Hajj and he didn't find a God. So he takes dates and he puts them on a palm, on, on a branch, and he puts that branch together and he starts to worship that. And then he eats his own God. That's, that's what Umar radiallahu anhu was like before Islam. That's what the second most influential person after the prophets in our deen was like. That's what the man who Rasulullah sallallahu said, لَوْ كَانَ نَبِيًّا مِنْ بَعْدِ لَكَانَ عُمَرَ That if there was to be a prophet after me, it would have been Umar was like. That's what the man who Rasulullah sallallahu says, that there were people in the ummah that came before you, the nations that came before you, that were muhaddathun, spoken to by the angels. They had some sort of instinct that was magnificent, that no other people would have. And if there is anyone in my ummah that's like that, it's Umar radiallahu anhu. He was a person who used to get drunk every single night. Do away with his aql every single night, his intellect every single night. And the only time that he would consider worship is whenever he had no one to get drunk with. When he looks for people to get drunk with him, and he finds that his buddies are not there, he says, well, you know what? Let me go consider some ibadah right now. Let me go consider an act of worship. Let me go to the Kaaba and do some, some tawaf or something like that. I don't have anything to get drunk with tonight. The same way that we think. If there is a Lakers game, I don't think the masjid is as full as it is when there isn't a Lakers game. Or for, for the older generation, when cricket's going on, although everyone's awake at 4 o'clock in the morning, Salat al-Fajr, I'm sure, is not as packed as it should be. But you know what? When there is no cricket and there is no Lakers game, let's go to the masjid. Let's benefit. Let's do some ibadah so we can feel good about ourselves. It's not priority, but let's infuse some ibadah in there. So Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu decides to go to the Kaaba. And this is where he finds Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam alone, reciting Qur'an in the middle of the night. What a perfect opportunity to do away with him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But you know what? He's curious. I wonder what he's reciting. So he says that I crept under the cloth of the Kaaba and I went around the Kaaba to where Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam was reciting until I was face to face with him. Subhanallah, think about this. I was face to face with him. The only thing between them was that thin cloth of the Kaaba. And I was listening to the words that he was reciting. This is his first exposure to Quran. What is Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam reciting Surah Al-Haqah? And he's listening to these beautiful words. But you know what? His heart doesn't have the capacity to accept these words yet. So he says, he must be a poet. He must be a poet. These words are too incredible. He must be a poet. He didn't think to himself, this must be revelation. He must be a poet. Then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam recited, وَمَا هُوَ بِقَوْلِ شَاعِرٌ these are not the words of a poet, little do you believe. So he's astonished. And he says, well in that case he must be a soothsayer. How does he know what I'm thinking? He's reading my thoughts. This can't possibly be revelation. He must be a soothsayer. And these are not the words of a soothsayer either. Little do you remember. But these are the, this is the revelation from the Most High. 
What is his response the first time? He got sick. He was so affected that he got sick that he went to his house and he was confused. What is it that just happened? But the way he reacts to his confusion the first time is not that let me consider that this might be revelation. He says, you know what, this whole thing is getting me so bundled up inside. Let me just go kill Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If I kill him, I won't be confused anymore. SubhanAllah, look at his mindset, his mentality. And we all know what happens there. And I'm going to fast forward a bit to the second exposure of Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu to the Qur'an. Surah Taha. After he realizes how reckless of a person he is, when he slaps his own sister, when he has beaten a noble man, and he sees the blood from his own sister, and he realizes that this is not something that's befitting of a man, and he says, let me read what you guys are reading. This time he has the capacity. This time he wants to read. And he opens the, he reads from that Qur'an, from that sheet. طَاهَا مَا أَنزَلْنَا عَلَيْكَ الْقُرْآنَ لِتَشْقَى إِلَّا تَذْكِرَةً لِمَنْ يَخْشَى تَنْزِيلًا مِمَّنْ خَلَقَ الْأَرْضَ وَالسَّمَاوَاتِ الْعُلَى الرَّحْمَنُ عَلَى الْعَرْشِ اسْتَوَى لَهُ مَا فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَمَا فِي الْأَرْضِ وَمَا بَيْنَهُمَا وَمَا تَحْتَ الثَّرَى Listen to how beautiful these words are. طَاهَا We did not reveal this Qur'an on you لِتَشْقَى To cause you distress. إِلَّا تَذْكِرَةً لِمَنْ يَخْشَى Except for a person, a reminder لِمَنْ يَخْشَى for a person at this point who has the capacity, at this point who has some fear of Allah Azza wa Jal, at this point has some humility. This is a revelation from the one who created the heavens and the earth and everything that is in between them. Ar-Rahman ala al-Arsh istawa. Ar-Rahman, the most merciful, ascended the throne. Everything around us, the heavens and the earth and everything that is within and between belongs to Ar-Rahman. And subhanAllah al-Azim, from that moment on, you have a man who is willing to go to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who not only is considering this might be revelation, although I want you to really think about this, dear brothers and sisters, which one was a more powerful experience? Think about this. Taha is a beautiful surah. But if I'm standing in front of a person, who's responding to all of my thoughts, that's a more powerful experience than Taha. But listen to his reaction this time. He goes to Rasulullah wasallam, and he wants to take this deen out to the public. As Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu says, the Islam of Umar was a victory for this deen. The Islam of Umar was izzah, was honor and glory. And he goes and he's looking for people to proclaim his no, new faith to. He's looking for Abu Jahl and he knocks on Abu Jahl's door. I'm a Muslim now. And Abu Jahl tells him something that I really can't mention in the khutbah, I guess, right? May Allah curse you. May your Lord curse you. And he's looking for someone to spill the, the news. He's looking for the Fox News and the CNN and all these people of Mecca now so that they can get the word out. So he can stand firm on his faith. Although this experience was not as powerful as the first one. In a matter of 24 hours, Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu had completely taken this deen and his own spirituality to a new level. And Islam was being proclaimed in the streets of Mecca and he was fighting for it and he was sacrificing for it. What's the difference, dear brothers and sisters? The second time around, his qalb, his heart had the capacity to accept that which was being recited. As Imam al-Muzani rahimahullah says, أَسْلَمَ بِطَاهَا فَكَانَ أَجْمَلْ مِنَ الشَّمْسِ فِي ضُحَاهَا وَأَوْضَحُ مِنَ الْقَمَرِ إِذَا تَلَاهَا فَوَلَّ الْأُمَّةَ فَرَعَاهَا فَدَخَلَ الْجَنَّةَ فَحَيَّتْهُ فَحَيَّاهَا In a matter of a moment, أَسْلَمَ بِطَاهَا Just a few words of Taha. And he was more beautiful than the sun whenever the sun has risen. And he was more beautiful than the full moon. He was clearer in his Islam than the full moon. 
he lit this ummah up, he brought this ummah to its glory. فَدَخَلَ الْجَنَّةَ فَحَيَّتْهُ فَحَيَّاهَا Entered into paradise and he greeted it and it greeted him. But it all came from a few words. But his heart had the capacity to accept it. Now I want you to think about these two incidents and the incident of Tufayl ibn Amr al-Dawsi and consider this one ayah from the Qur'an. أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنَ أَمْ عَلَىٰ قُلُوبٍ أَقْثَالُهَا don't they contemplate the Qur'an or are their hearts locked? Are their hearts locked? And I want you to think very, very profoundly about the difference between those men and us. And the difference between Umar part 1 and Umar part 2. If you are already reading the Qur'an and you don't have the capacity to listen to what the Qur'an is telling you, you don't have the capacity to listen to Khutbah al Hajjah. These words are nothing to you. These words are routine for you. Then there is a problem there. And many of us will sit and think, why is it that the Qur'an doesn't affect me? Many of us complain. All of us have this problem. We're definitely not like the Sahaba where we leave the masajid and we put tears all over the place. We're definitely not like that. And we all complain. We're all sad about this. If you're not sad, that's even a greater indication that you need to be scared. We're all sad over this. How come I cannot have the same amount of khushu' as those men? Why doesn't my heart get affected like them? Because if you read the Qur'an, dear brothers and sisters, and if you listen to the khutbah al if you listen to all these words praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if your heart does not have the capacity to absorb it, if your heart is already full of something else other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if your heart has holes in it from the sins that you've committed, there is no way that you're going to be able to accept it the way that those men accepted it. And Allah Azza wa Jal tells us very, 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 in a very profound manner, the reason why the kuffar did not want to listen to the Qur'an, the reason why the Qur'an had no effect on the Qur'an, وَإِذَا تُتْلَىٰ عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتُنَا بَيِّنَاتٍ قَالَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا if you recite the ayat of Allah Azza wa Jal on them, قَالَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا Kufur means to reject. Kufur means to reject. Kufur means to conceal. They were concealing the truth. They were concealing everything that they knew to be true. They said to the truth when it came to them, and this is not the traditional way of composing a sentence. But Allah Azza wa Jal already mentioned their attribute of kufr before He mentioned why they were rejecting the Qur'an. قَالَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا لِلْحَقِّ لَمَّا جَاءَهُمْ They said whenever the truth came to them, هَذَا سِحْرٌ مُبِينٌ أَمْ يَقُولُونَ افْتَرَى They're constantly making excuses up. He made this all up. Why is it that Allah Azza wa Jal is saying that this is their problem? Because Allah Azza wa Jal also tells us, Whenever the ayat are recited upon them, kalla bal rana ala qulubihim ma kanu yaksibun. There is a stain on their hearts. Their hearts are covered because of that which they used to do, and they already had an ulterior motive. They already had an agenda to reject the Quran. When you read the Quran, dear brothers and sisters, are you ready to accept what it tells you? Are you ready to accept its rulings? Are you ready to do as it tells you to do? Or are you reading it already with some hesitation? I want to read Surah Ar-Rahman because it makes me feel good. I want to read one of the nice surahs that don't talk about hell too much. You know, I'm not too comfortable with Surah An-Nisa. That one's not progressive enough for me. You're already reading it with a motive to push it away. And you wonder why it's not affecting your heart.